Chapter 4. All Religions Useful and Spiritually Medicinal. The clergy, by a figure of speech, which represents what ought to be rather than what always is, have been called physicians of the soul, and religion has been viewed as a spiritual medicine. This idea is given us in the scriptures. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why, then, is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? If, then, souls in great numbers are diseased, and lost, and bewildered in the darkness, is it not because the physician is unskillful, and his medicine inefficient, even if it is not positively injurious? Let us search for the true remedy, the spiritual specific. The minister is a spiritual physician, and has medicine for the mind in proportion as he reproduces in himself the life of Jesus the Christ, and teaches the truths which he proclaimed. All the various religions of the world are useful, and none of them could have been dropped out of human history in the general life of humanity without the race having suffered loss. They have all been factors in the progress and development of the human mind. They have all, in different degrees, accomplished the use of a spiritual medicine in healing the hurts of the soul and as preventives of something worse. The best medicine is that which prevents disease, the next best that which cures it. Religion serves both these uses to the soul. Every style of religious thought in life that has gained any considerable degree of currency in the world has M.O.T. some deeply felt one of the human spirit. It has often had imperfectly satisfied the instinctive cravings of the soul for spiritual nutriment, but its dry, and perhaps moldy, crusts have preserved the divinest realm of the soul's life from starvation and kept an absolute famine from its door. The great religions of the world have been the system of Confucius, Brahmanism, Buddhism, the system of Zoroaster, Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedism. Of more insignificant systems that have sprung out of these we need not speak. The most imperfect of all these religions have been a spiritual nutriment and a mental medicine to many millions of souls. To those who cannot live directly and immediately from the divine being, to which state Christianity elevates the soul, all other religions have served at least as a nursing bottle to prevent complete spiritual death and to furnish the means of spiritual growth. They have been as a gentle breath of wind from the heavens to keep alive the divine Promethean spark in human nature, and to prevent the smoking wick from going entirely out. All these religions, says S. Beringold, set themselves to respond to some craving of the head or heart of man, to satisfy some instinct, dimly felt and read, and however various, however contradictory they were in their expression. They did fulfill their office in some sort, else they would never have lasted a day. They differ unquestionably according to the stage of thought development of the several peoples and nations which embrace them. But their differences ought, if man is progressive, to be capable of arrangement in a series of progressively advancing truths. In every religion of the world is to be found distorted or exaggerated some great truth, otherwise it would never have obtained foothold. Every religious revolution has been the struggle of thought to gain another step in the ladder that reaches to heaven. The Christian religion, as a medicine and a nutriment to the spiritual life of man, has the advantage, in one respect, over all others, that it is in its nature eclectic. It is not in its spirit exclusive, but is inclusive of that which is good and true in them all. Jesus defines the word of God to be truth. It is the totality of all truth. So far as the sacred books of the different nations contain and record any spiritual truth, they are the word of God, or a manifestation of the Logos, the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Logos, or word, is the living principle of them all and without it they could have had no permanent hold upon the souls of men, for, in it is life, and the life is the light of men. Christianity has in its spirit and teachings the elements of universality, and thus may properly be called the natural religion, or the religion of humanity, while other systems are adapted only to particular peoples or races. As one has said, that which excludes or shuts out is not so great as that which takes in and receives. So, Christianity has received into itself all the good of many systems, the philosophy and arts of Greece, the laws of Combe, the mysticism of India, the monotheism of the Jews, the triad of Egypt, the war between good and evil taught by Zoroaster, the reverence for ancestors, and the conservatism of China, and the Scandinavian faith in liberty and progress. All the prophets, since the world began, and all the civilizations of the past, have, like the wise men of the East, brought their gifts to the infant Messiah. There is in this wonderful religion the power of assimilating to itself all that is true and good everywhere. It is like the sea, into which all rivers run, and yet is never full. Jesus left no written creed, no unalterable system of ecclesiastical polity, and no fixed forms of external worship. 
Everything was left to be unfolded by the spirit that was promised, the paraclete that was to lead into all truth and duty. The Christian system is constructed on the principle of progress, and thus bears the mark of divinity, and it cannot but administer to the healthy growth of all who receive it in its true spirit. Once in the soul, it is like the mustard grain that develops into a tree, or like a divine leaven that transforms the whole nature. A truly Catholic system that receives into itself all that is of permanent value in the world's science, philosophy, and religion, and that stimulates the growth of all that is good and true in the souls of men, must have a spiritually sanative efficiency. It is God's saving health, which the prophet prayed might he known among all nations. It is like the apocalyptic tree of life, whose roots drew fresh nutriment from the river of life, on the hanks of which it stood, its fruit is ever fresh and new, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This religion is everywhere in the scriptures represented as a spiritual medicine, and Jesus the Christ, as the founder and present life of the best system of religion the world ever saw, rightfully claims to be the great physician, a title the church in all the centuries has given him. In the infancy of the race, and in the earliest ages of human history, the sanative value of religion was fully recognized. Mankind were then more in a state of nature, and governed by instinct and intuition. The priests were the only physicians, and the temples were the place of cure, a sort of spiritual pharmacy where the body was affected and healed through the mind. Civilization is in some sense an unnatural and artificial condition, as was taught by Rouse Seal, and in it man is influenced more by reason, which is a far more imperfect guide than instinct. But we must be converted and become as little children before we can enter the kingdom of the heavens or come into the closest sympathetic relations with the general sphere of life and light in the world above. When the religion of the Christ is divorced from all the shams and counterfeits that last current for it, and is pruned of all that a priestly ecclesiasticism has grafted into it, and it becomes what it was in its founder, a sympathetic union with the living God and the ever-present angel world, it will be the power of God and the wisdom of God unto salvation to body and soul.